favorite number from junior year of high school is Justinian. Justin is his uncle, so then they call him Justinian, that's the nephew. Um, he actually rises from plain origin. He is actually a peasant, but he's very clever. And um, something I don't think you guys realize when people rule for a really long time, so if you look at his reign, it's from 527 to 65. So if you take and do the math, how many years is he ruling? 32. And the average lifespan of a Roman citizen at that time period was 31 years. Mm -hmm. So when someone ruled for 30 some years, they actually ruled through entire people's lifespans. That is what is so noteworthy about Justinian and also the other long ruling rulers because people didn't live as long. If your average lifespan is 31 and you're ruling for longer than a person is alive, you're basically all of history for some people. <coughs> they only know the time under Justinian. It's like when I ask you, so who was the president when you were born? And then go through the presidents that you've lived through. It, it'll never be like this because we have a term limit. So you've lived through multiple eras of change. Okay, so Justinian the first. Um, these are mosaics. You guys should recognize these mosaics because I'm pretty much they're they're known for mosaics in the Byzantine Empire. Uh, he marries Theodora. You heard in the video they had called her a burlesque dancer, which is a nice way of saying an exotic or erotic dancer. They called her a prostitute. Some other videos and some other places call her a courtesan. Courtesans are a very nice way of saying someone who entertains men in many ways. So like, did she stay being a hooker after she married him? No, she's the empress. What the hell? What are you thinking? <laughs> hookers are not hookers because they like it, Carter. <laughs> exactly. She's a courtesan. The issue with Theodora is she's really smart. And there was actually rules against him marrying her because of her class status. And he changes the rules in order to marry her, because he's the emperor. From your video thing, uh, I give you the term autocrat. You rule with complete authority. He was an autocrat, so he changes the rules so he can marry her. And then he makes her his co, she becomes the empress. He's the emperor, she's the empress. Go ahead. So if Theodora was a burlesque dancer and Justinian was a peasant, how did either of them end up on the throne? Well, Justin the first, his uncle, I do not know how he gets to the throne, because I was actually looking up this morning, because this has puzzled me for decades. Uh, luck, I'm going to say, completely has to do with luck and being extremely smart. Because at from 476, when the fall of Rome to the 6th century, the empire was weak in Europe. So they were not sending um, Constantine, even though he's from the east, doesn't become the emperor from the east of the Eastern Empire. He becomes the emperor and sent to the east from Rome, because Rome has the real power. But because they are so weak and they were dealing with invasions, they pretty much stayed out of the Eastern Empire's, um, I don't know, business affairs. Um, they seized their power through bureaucracy. They form alliances with high-ranking officials that are willing to put them in power because of what they are willing to do for the bureaucracy when they get in power. Uh, and she's a strong advisor. What else happens? Um, two big things happen. He's, he's going to um, gain strength through three main ways, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. But yesterday the video told you about an early problem he has in his reign. 527 he starts. 532, so he's barely been on the throne for five years, and he has his empress, you know, who was a little bit of um, a scandal to the empire in the beginning. The blues and the greens. The blues and the greens are actual chariot racing teams, but they're just like our political parties. They're not just chariot racing teams. It's like Republicans and Democrats. The blues and the greens in the Hippodrome, and okay, here's kind of 
uh, what's going on. But you have the Hippodrome right here, and the Great Palace is right next to it, the Forum of Constantine, the Forum of Theodosius. That's where his obelisk was for a long time, and I'm not sure if it's still there or if it's been moved. Uh, Hagia Sophia, the wall of Constantine that he puts around the city, and then the walls of Theodosius with the major gates that you saw that whole construction. Um, so what happens in 532? Taxes. This all starts over taxes. Justinian needs a lot of money to run the government and the empire, and he overly taxes, or the people feel like they are being overly taxed. Because of that over that over taxation, um, they decide to stage a riot, which is called the Nika riot, or sometimes it's called a revolt. And they do this in the Hippodrome, and they do it over the course of a week. It's the most violent uh, riot in the history of Constantinople. At the end of it, nearly half the city was burned or destroyed. Tens of thousands of people were killed. It totally began as a sport riot between the two different chariot teams and it grew to a full-scale revolt. It threatened Justinian's throne. He's five years into his um, reign, and he wants to flee the city. He actually goes to the harbor with his advisors, and he's preparing to leave. And Theodora shows up, and she's dressed all in purple, because purple is the color of royalty. Remember, it was really difficult to get the dye for purple because you took it from uh, sea creatures, and you ground it up, and you needed an immense amount of it to make purple. So. In antiquity, if you're dressed in purple, you're pretty awesome. Now, any old people can wear purple. Um, but anyway, she comes to him and she's, she says something snappy like, purple is a good color to die in. I'm not leaving the city, this is our city. I didn't come up from nothing to run away from something like this. She convinces him actually to stay and fight. So he assembles his, his um, Forces. And you saw that yesterday he uses a bit of um, subterfuge. He invites the blues and the greens to the Hippodrome. And it seems like he's going to give concessions and that he's going to uh, negotiate with the two sides. Instead, he slaughters the 30,000 that show up. Massacre. But because of this, and it's only five years into his reign, there are no further revolts or riots from people protesting his policies because he's just shown um, that he is going to rule with complete authority. And you're like, um, he gets another legacy that you might have heard of. Uh, there's this thing called the plague. And there was two plagues during Greek times, but during the Byzantine Empire, there's the Justinian Plague, 541 to 542. Maybe three weeks ago, I was listening to NPR, and they've actually found uh, skeletal remains that have traces of this plague in them. They can take little DNA and find out how they died, and it's actually linked to the Justinian Plague, that those bacteria stay viable to figure out what forms they were for so long. Um, how does it come about? He imports grain from Egypt, and when he imports the grain from Egypt, this bacteria, Escherichia pestis, comes along, flees on rats, bring it into the city. And that's pretty much how it gets transported throughout the whole world. There is still the same plague in the world that killed millions. It still exists. In fact, when you go to the Grand Canyon, the funniest sign I ever saw, because it seems so crazy. It says, beware of squirrels. They carry bubonic plague. And I'm not kidding about this, and it is accurate. They do carry bubonic plague, and people do get bubonic plague in the modern age. 5,000 to 10,000 deaths per day during this period of plague. I want you to think of a city and dealing with that many dead bodies. Because in the morning, lots of the people you know could be dead by the evening. It's that devastating to populations. Which one had more deaths, this one or the bubonic plague? It's the same 
This one kills 40% of the population. In Europe, it kills 60% of the population. Um, so 40% of Constantinople plus the outlying areas, 40% of that population dies in this one year period. Is that why we hear about the bubonic plague more because more people? We hear about it more because we are Western European biased. Because there have been plagues throughout history that we don't even care about. Because we are Western, this is Byzantine, they're Eastern, we don't care about them, even though they're Romans. 40% um, of Constantinople's population in the outlying area. By the year 700 AD, 60% of Europe's total population is dead. Same plague, just moving through. What kind of things would make it have a really good spread in a large area? Roads. Sewer system. So were the people who didn't die, did they just not get the disease, or were they still sick and just lived through it? Or? Both. Some didn't get the disease at all. Some recovered from the disease, and then they have an immunity, and then the next time it comes through your city, they tend to resist it because they've already resisted it one time. It's the concept of a vaccine. Once you have had it and you have fought it off, you have the resistance to this bacteria. It's like if you have a smallpox shot, they actually inject virus and you actually get a pox. They bubbling up on your skin where your body is fighting it off, but it's a much smaller amount than if you were exposed to it in the air, you know, in a city that has a whole bunch of dead bodies that someone has to move those bodies. Someone has to get them out of there. Or some of them like typhoid Mary, like carriers. Yes, some people can get it, not show any symptoms at all, and carry it to a new location. And one more sad thing about, oh, so anyway, see these little lovely little scars? So sometimes you'll see um, leaders in Europe who lived through the plague and have really scarred faces from those pustules. What is this plague? Is it just like the bubonic plague? It is the bubonic plague. Only they call it the Justinian because it's the one year in Constantinople. Same, um, same bacteria. This is a painting of lots of dead bodies. People hauling out dead bodies. Um, how would we treat it today? Antibiotics, which is why it's so crucial we don't develop antibiotic resistance. And why you shouldn't take antibiotics like you're like, oh, I have an earache, let me go to the doctor. And then the doctor, because you're crying, and you're like, oh, my ear, it hurts so. Then they give you an antibiotic, which by the way, most ear infections don't need antibiotics. You can just go to the drugstore and get like a little kit. You can just get eardrops and you can take Advil and you'll be okay in a couple days. Or people are like, oh, sinus infection, I just need antibiotics again. This is why I was wondering these were more. And then you get resistance because today we use like streptomycin and tetracycline and 85% of today's cases are curable. But, so that does mean there is a 15% mortality rate still with plague today. Who do you think is more likely to die? Invincible people. Yeah. And, wow. and this is like, this is like the flu and everything else people always You know what else? Have. People who don't seek treatment. There are the people that are like, oh, it's just, I don't know, my toe is turning black. Let me just try to walk it off. Do you have fever? And then you start to get these little boil things that first they're like, it looks like hives and then it looks like big pustule things, like their faces, remember, then they had the little things on their faces. Yep, and that happens everywhere, and your toes turn black, and it's lovely. Nice. That's well, yeah, I had like a rash. Was it like, oh, it's not necessarily transmitted by water. It's really that bacteria on the plate. 